Good evening and welcome to this evening's Automobile Division Lecture. I'm Paul Jones, Chairman of the Automobile Division, and it's my pleasure to introduce Lotus Shaping the Future. Our guest speaker tonight is Uday Senapati, Executive Director for Corporate Strategy and Product Management at Lotus. Uday joined Lotus in August 2018 as the Executive Director for Corporate Strategy and Product Management. He's responsible for the company strategy, product management of future cars, and digital products and services, as well as strategic partnerships. Trained as an engineer and in business management, Uday has worked on numerous vehicle projects at various global companies and within different areas of product development. Prior to joining Lotus, he worked at Bentley Motors, where he was responsible for turning Mulliner, a dormant section of the business, into a successful and profitable special vehicles division. Along with technical areas of business, he has also led teams covering project management, procurement, supply chain management, production, and logistics. Uday has a great passion for cars and automotive brands. He's proud to be part of the team that has been entrusted with reinvigorating the Lotus brand and growing the business significantly. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Uday. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Uday Senapati from uh, Lotus Cars. And uh, I've got uh, this great privilege to be amongst you all. And I see that um, you all have joined uh, primarily from the UK, but uh, from uh, many other places in the world. So thank you very much for joining us today. And um, I hope that uh, over the next half an hour, I can take you through some of the interesting aspects of um, Lotus Evaya, uh, our latest and greatest uh, of what engineering world can uh, provide and produce. So very quickly, just going through the uh, agenda of uh, what I'd like to cover today. Uh, and, and I promise you that I'll give you uh, enough time for you to uh, send any questions and I'll try and answer them as, as well as I can um, to satisfy your technical uh, needs of understanding more about this amazing product. So I'll start with uh, just a little bit about me uh, in terms of you knowing who you are listening to. Uh, a bit of the history of Lotus, which is quite an interesting journey. Uh, that the brand and the company has had. Uh, many of you would be aware uh, there are lots of enthusiasts in the world who know a lot about Lotus, probably even more than me, but I'd like to just recap a bit on that. Um, Vision 80, I'll just explain what that is um, and, and why. Uh, I touch upon the core values or, or the Lotus DNA as we call it, uh, and what that is, why that is, and uh, how this flagship product that uh, we brought out called Ibaya uh, encompasses all these um, core values and showcases the Lotus DNA in the best possible manner. Uh, we'll then go into Ibaya itself and um, we'll talk about the uh, performance stats of, uh, of the car. We'll go into a bit more detail of some of the more detailed aspects uh, in terms of the attributes and other things of the Ibaya and what could you expect to see from Lotus going forward. So uh, I'll also give you a little bit of glimpse into the future of Lotus without having not, you know, telling you a lot more about uh, what's to come because it's got to be an exciting journey that I hope that you'll follow uh, from here on. Uh, and then you know, just talking briefly about uh, why electric and what electric uh, going forward Lotus will embrace. So I hope that's okay. So I'll start very quickly with me. Uh, as I said, my name is Uday Esenapati. Uh, I'm Executive Director for uh, Corporate Strategy and uh, Product Management at Lotus. Joined Lotus um, just over two years ago uh, as one of the early members of the management uh, team of the company as the company was going into this new journey of uh, growth and expansion uh, and redevelopment of the brand. Um, I'll talk about that uh, brand and that history in a bit, but uh, just before starting Lotus, uh, you know, starting at Lotus rather, I worked at uh, Bentley for uh, uh, 10 years, 
which was part of the Volkswagen Group, so had great experience working with obviously the brand there, which is another uh, amazing British brand, but also being part of a bigger automotive group uh, and how that uh, shaped some of my career. Uh, and then before that, I worked for Jaguar Land Rover and General Motors and started my career at Mahindra uh, in India. Uh, I was trained as an engineer, but uh, I also got a master's degree in, in uh, uh, business administration. So that makes me you know, stretch my boundaries of thinking into the world of uh, strategy, being an entrepreneur uh, and being a business leader. So hopefully you'll, you'll hear some of those aspects uh, in the presentation today. As I said, um, you know, Lotus, so, you know, again, going back to, you know, who I am and why I'm here, it's, it's a fascinating brand. And if you go to think about it, um, these brands, like, you know, some of these amazing British automotive brands were born uh, in the early 1900s uh, and got a great lineup of, uh, you know, products from its history, some great heritage, some amazing stories. Uh, you know, some formed some really amazing pub stories, I've got to say. Uh, and, and that was my appeal when I was approached to uh, come and work for Lotus. And everyone who's joined Lotus in the last sort of three years uh, have all come in with that, um, you know, appeal for the brand, the heritage, the history, but more importantly, what's going to happen in the future, uh, especially under this uh, new ownership. Uh, we're part of uh, the GD Group. We are majority uh, stake holding is by Geely, which is the fastest uh, growing automotive group in the world. Uh, and minority shareholding is with Etika, a Malaysian uh, company, a big company, which is again uh, showcasing the promise of not just growing as part of a big automotive fastest growing group, but also the backing of the, um, uh, the funding and, and uh, commitment towards the brand going forward. But why? Why all this commitment? Why people are coming here and why are we doing this? There's a great deal of that uh, to be talked about in terms of the history of this brand. And um, you'll see from you know these couple of slides that I'm going to show you here, the man on the left uh, is called Colin Chapman. And uh, Colin started this company in 1948 for the love of cars, for the love of uh, motorsports, for the love of pure driving experience. And he really revolutionized the way cars were seen back then, and especially in the arena of motorsports. When he came to this arena, people started to dislike him pretty quickly, and that was a sign of sure success. Um, he brought in very radically different ideas uh, to the arena. He brought in very uh, maverick changes to how cars were built, how cars were tested, how cars were raced. And that forms the ethos of the company. You know, and it's been over the last uh, 72 years now um, and will obviously carry on going forward because that's something many companies do not have. And, and we do have that. And we've got to carry that forward into our future. Now, he started this as a car company, but also as an engineering company. And these companies coming together created some very, very exciting products that went on to race. And Lotus is still uh, having not raced in Formula One, for example, for over a decade. We're still in the top you know, echelons of um, the winning teams, the winning constructors, the winning cars, the, the winning drivers of Formula One. So that tells you, you know, how, how powerful this brand, the products were in the past. It doesn't just uh, sit with motorsports that we were good at. Um, we were also good at doing some really exciting cars. And of the yesteryears, uh, if you think of cars like the Lotus Elan or the Lotus Elite or the Lotus Esprit, these were groundbreaking cars from a design perspective, from what they were technically, from how simple they were, how light they were, and what they were uh, they were aiming at achieving by being so simple was the greatness of, of what Lotus was. Um, and this has continued uh, over the last 70 odd years. 
and uh, some of the great cars have appeared in some amazing uh, you know aspects like uh, Hollywood films to other showcase media. But this wasn't just restricted to cars and motorsport. We went into doing other things. And as I said earlier, Colin also established the engineering arm of the business, which did extremely well. And Lotus Engineering, as many of you might know of, went on to do some really amazing uh, things with many companies. You know, worked with other brands. Um, we worked with um, Vauxhall to create you know, cars that are now very renowned out there. Uh, with Ford, with many companies, we worked with Tesla to start the whole journey of Tesla. The first Roadster was based on an Elise, and it was uh, you know, engineered and produced in our factory here in Petal uh, in England. So, so some really great stories out there, some really good uh, heritage out there, and some really award-winning cars that we've got in our history. And where is that taking us you know, going forward? And because given we created the first of many things in our past, so we had to you know, do something as a first of you know, the new era. And there's a lot of head scratching going on at the company. And as you can imagine, there is some things that will sit very well with the current enthusiast fans of Lotus and some things that will not. And one such decision was going electric, which is a very, very controversial decision uh, going, you know, to be made in the history of Lotus, which we had to make, you know, in the last uh, sort of three years, you know, especially when I started. The whole strategy had to be designed to face the future. And it was very important, what of these legacies do we lose? What of these legacies do we carry forward? It was a very fine balance of what we pick up from our past, what we celebrate from our past, but also thinking very carefully about the future. The world is changing drastically. The environment is changing significantly. We've got to create something that car enthusiasts love, but at the same time, we really need to worry about where the future of this planet is and making sure that we fit all those bills. And that gave birth to our idea of one, going into the electric world, um, but still maintaining the core Lotus DNA. And that is what um, the epitome of that is Evaya. So we'll go into talking about Evaya in a minute. I'll just very quickly touch upon you know, where we go from here, though, because Evaya is not the end, it's the beginning of this new journey, as we call the Vision 80. Why Vision 80? We started this journey when we were 70 years old, and that was in 2018. And we put a plan together for our next 10 years, which takes us to 2028. And that is what we call the Vision 80. This is the next 10 years. And in these next 10 years, we've got a big, very ambitious uh, plan to reform this business, to celebrate this brand again, and to really put this in a place which it deserves, which has not been the case over the last two decades. So as part of the Vision 80, uh, we have a 10-year plan uh, under the shareholders, as I explained earlier. And uh, what we want to do is you know, continue to deliver positive results every year. We have to revolutionize our product range, uh, keeping again some of the DNA we've got, which is significantly greater than anything out there, and it's still seen as benchmark out there in the sporting world. So we've got to carry that forward, but bring in some really exciting new products to the market. And then going forward, obviously, transform our business. We can't live as the same old, you know, Norfolk-based company that we've always been. We've got to become a global player, and that's something that you'll see in the near future. I've talked a lot about this uh, core values and DNA and what should we not lose whilst we grow ourselves into a global player and what not. So what are these, these, these core values? You know, as I said earlier, Colin was very keen on pure driving experience and that is something we cannot take away. So that has to stay in and you'll see from the context of Evaya what that means. 
we have always been pioneering mavericks and uh, that cannot change again you know we can take that risk we can go beyond we can do unconventional things and that's something that will continue to happen going forward and technology i mean we live in a world of technology we all have got devices you know gadgets and as we are in this world today like this this particular example of uh, this uh, you know session we are in we should i would have loved for all of us to be in a room you know sitting together looking at each other and talking about such an exciting topic but here we are you know as our little gadgets watching this talking about this and and interacting so technology will play a big part of our uh, you know a role in our in our lives going forward so how do we do that in in cars like these you know so there has to be some soul to that technology and that's what we firmly believe in and you will see a lot of that going forward and that sort of takes us to you know what is our purpose we exist for one reason only you know we are first last and always for the driver and that is not going to change you know we make or we've always made exciting cars for the driver that every driver has jumped into a lotus has thoroughly enjoyed and that we cannot change and our vision is uh, quite simple you know we'll stand out as a performance brand of choice again for those who dare to look beyond the conventional and ordinary so that taking all of that you know is quite a lot to take in and put that into a product so it had to be something very exciting so key things that we picked up from there were, were the pure driving experience the engaging and the rewarding bit of every journey that you make uh, using a Lotus. The pure performance feel shouldn't be overwhelming. It shouldn't be something that takes control over you. You should be the one taking control of the animal that you're with. The pure connection. Lotus has always been known for the connection to the road, to what the car is doing. And that has not to go away. The pure lightweight focus. Again, we'll talk about that in the context of the electric world. It's quite significant and very important. And intelligent design. We've always believed in the form and the function sort of working hand in hand. And a lot of that relies on, you know, things like thermal management, aerodynamics. And these things become extremely important going forward when we dive into this, the, the world of electric cars. And then pure ergonomics. I mean, one thing we've got to say, you know, not everything was always great. Lotus cars were fantastic. But if you said to someone, could you live with this car for, you know, on a daily basis? I'm sure most of the answers would be not really. Why is that? These cars were designed and produced for a certain reason, for you to go and have fun, for you to connect with the car. But not always, you know, not every day, not every hour that you want to just connect and keep doing that you know, thrill-seeking experiences. You've got to be able to live with these cars. So some of that will have to improve going forward and a lot of focus will be on that. So that brings us to Lotus Evaya. Why does this have all of those and more? Firstly, this car had to signify and, and be a statement of intent of what the future brings for us as a brand and as a company. It's pure electric car, the very first British pure electric hypercar. This car has got the same proportions and the same layout as a very traditional mid-engine sports car, which is something of an extreme challenge when you get into the world of electric. And we'll touch upon that in a bit more detail later. As you might be able to see some of the aerodynamic sculpture type of features that only Lotus is, is, is really good at, we brought that in. As you see, the car feels like it is carved by air. The air is not struggling to flow through the car. It's almost a porous elements to the car, how it's shaped by nature. And that's how it flows freely through air. As I said, being a mid-engine sports car is a challenge of an outside world when it comes to the electric technology and we still absolutely 100 percent maintain that and as you see 
the statement of intent is all about not just what we've always done, but also about the future technologies, the best of electric wood, the best of in-car technologies, and so on. And when we launched this car in July um, and showed this to the world in August 2019, it was uh, certainly received extremely well uh, by the media and by the enthusiasts by the world. Uh, who, who followed the automotive world. It was a bit of a stunner and something that people were not expecting from Lotus. Of course, there were questions about why this and uh, only the incredible performance tax and attributes will tell you why Ivaya. I'll very quickly show you a quick film, you know, just to show what's uh, this car about and where we are with this car and then dive straight into some more technical details. Well, I hope you uh, saw a bit of what that car is about. You saw the old new factory where Vaya will be produced. And you saw one of the first prototypes being tested on our uh, racetrack in our factory. So what is this car and what can it do? And uh, just to give you a glimpse of you know, what this is, it's the first all electric hypercar from a British car maker. And we are really proud to be that British car maker to be bringing this out. The very first uh, new model launched under this new ownership structure. Uh, it's a bold statement of intent, as I said earlier. Uh, it showcases many of our ambitions, the new design language, the new technology, the new way of powering the cars going forward, uh, and things that uh, we probably haven't been you know, really good at. We do want to improve those, and you'll see all this in uh, what, what uh, Lotus Ibaya is. It's the most powerful and uh, dynamically accomplished car in the history of Lotus. And every one uh, of our test drivers who've taken the car out on the track have said they've never been in anything like this before. It's something we are extremely proud of being designed, engineered, and built here in the UK. And it's halo of our range and uh, showcases you know, many of the things that are to come. We have been bringing first of many things and game changes, and this certainly will be one of them. And that can only be justified by showcasing you know, some of the key attributes to you. The weight, I mean, very important. Lotus enthusiasts have always argued about the lowest weight car that we can bring out. Lotus Elise, when it came out, was less than 1,000 kilos. Now, these are incredible numbers. Going forward in the electric world, as you'll see when we get into the things like the battery, uh, the weight becomes an extreme challenge, I have to say, to say the least. Now, when you look at performance, electric sports cars, uh, now some have started to come out now, and many more will come out in the near future. The weight becomes an extreme challenge, and everyone who's bringing cars out are talking of two tons or more. This car, with the incredible performance that it brings out at 2,000 PS of power, is less than 1,700 kilos, and we are working hard on making this even lower. So that's an, an achievement in its own right. It's got class leading power to weight of uh, over one, one is to one. Some of the performance stats are, are quite incredible, even for us to digest. When we ran our first simulations and we found these numbers, 
we just couldn't believe them. And we had to go and try and test these things to prove to ourselves. And we are astonished by the results. And you've got to go and research this to find out what this means when I say zero to 300 kilometers per hour is less than nine seconds. And that's not all. There is some amazing other things. When you look at class leading downfalls, when I talk about it, just see what that number actually means when you relate that to the first stat on this page. The downforce is greater than the weight of the car. And that, again, is a true achievement. And as, I, as you, you might be able to see from the design of the car, the aerodynamics and design work hand in hand to bring these aspects out. And this is what I call the true Lotus DNA. And putting this on a racetrack, I can certainly tell you this car is absolutely true to Lotus DNA. I'll go into a little bit of detail of some of the aspects. There are several things I would have loved to cover, but uh, given the time we've got and to allow you guys to be able to ask some good questions, you know, I'll talk about just a few, you know, just a couple of things here. One is the chassis, and I, I really wanted to talk about this chassis. This is one of the largest single piece automotive carbon fiber tubs, as we call them, or monocoques. Um, and and it's, it's produced in Europe and uh, you know, it's the largest in, you know, in the world. It's it's incredible piece of what this, this uh, chassis is, as you can see there. It's hand layup, it's one piece with integrated front and rear subframes, and that is to maximize this chassis performance. And all of that weighs 129 kilos. So again, it's very, very, very true to what Lotus DNA has always been about. Very true to the layout and the structure of what the car should be. And just to you know bring that to light, you know, what does that mean? That layout, as you see there, is very true to what Lotus um, layouts have always been. As you see there, it's the mid-engine layout. Here, the engine is, of course, um, replaced with the battery pack, which obviously then couples with uh, the incredible you know, four-motor system, motor inverter systems, which are, again, designed purely for this car. Everything that you see in the via is purpose-designed engineered and built for this car. It's never been seen in the world before. The battery is all new. Uh, this battery will not seen what will not be seen in uh, the mass market for at least five years. Uh, uh, but yeah, again, you can never say with the uh, speed of how technology is developing. I'd love to see this sooner, but it's quite an advanced cells, uh, quite uh, advanced chemistry. Quite an advanced way of how the battery pack is uh, is designed and put together, and the battery pack itself weighs uh, just under forty percent of the vehicle weight. Now these produce the challenges of uh, BEV, as we call it, the battery electric vehicle domain that we we venture into going forward. But uh, still using all those technologies in creating the best Lotus design aspect, we thankfully were were able to produce exactly that, as you see here. And uh, yeah, that brings out those Lotus Dynamics that uh, we're really famous for. So as I say, just building on those couple of you know, key attributes, the key DNA items, you know, what, what could you expect to see going forward uh, in our other future cars? Uh, you will see efficient aerodynamics, as you see. I mean, this car is obviously an epitome of what uh, passive natural aerodynamics can do with the design of the car. And you will continue to see more of that going forward. But there are a lot of active aerodynamic features in here, which again, are some things that you would see in the future on our cars. Uh, whatever segment we would like to venture into, you will still be able to see and, and get the experience of all of this in, in, in those cars. The driving dynamics, uh, as I explained here, but not just the layout, but how the car behaves in every aspect and every car, whatever segment it is, will certainly be designed to go around the racetrack. The porosity, as I talked about earlier, 
which is the form and function, it will come together very, very well. And again, you can expect that from every car that we bring out in the future. And the weight efficiency, as I said earlier, weight is always going to be a challenge in the world of dev cars. Now, we can't just fight it, but we can optimize it to make the best use of that weight to do what we really like to do with our cars. But still, you know, the promise is there that uh, will still be the lowest weight, the most efficient in weight uh, in every segment that we go into. That form and function, as I talked about, uh, as you see, you know, in, in really high tech, highly engineered things like Pfizer planes, you know, that, that will be certainly the case of every car uh, we do going forward. I talked about electric, you know, I'd just like to highlight that a bit more because the future is electric, whether we like it or not. The world is going that way. Instead of fighting these things, we should embrace it. At Lotus, we've always embraced what's to come. We've always been innovative. We've always brought the new things forward. And we've always embraced uh, the future. So instead of fighting the electric, we embrace it and we'll bring more of that. But it's not easy. And uh, it will have to be the heartbeat of Lotus going forward. So for that, we'll have to do a lot of work to prepare ourselves going forward. So it's not just about the car. Now the world is way bigger. In the past, it was easy to do a car, give it to you know, the user. The user knows how to use the car, how to live with that car, how to fuel it up, and how to enjoy it. Now we've got to do a lot of that ourselves to support the user enjoying the car instead of getting bogged down with everything else. So at Lotus, we're working hard in uh, making all of that happen. We've partnered with Centrica, which you probably wouldn't know uh, or not know, but they are the parent company of British Gas, the largest energy provider uh, in the UK. Uh, and with them, we're working on some groundbreaking stuff, uh, not just on the EV infrastructure on how you charge cars, um, and, and not just at home, but uh, outside the home when you're on the move. Uh, but we're trying to take this to another level where we try and combine everything from the customer, the car, and the home into one single ecosystem. And you'll see more of that uh, you know, coming out in the, in the near future. We're also working hard on decarbonization and electric is a really good way of going that way. As um, heavy manufacturers, we all have a responsibility towards the future of uh, this planet. And we've really taken that seriously. And from 1st of October this year, we have turned all our energy sourcing, for all our facilities, to renewable energy guarantees of origin uh, energy sources. So that's our first step. And you'll see that going forward into our products, into the supply chain, into our logistics, and so on. And that is uh, the mission that we're on. Not losing the sporting pedigree that we've got at Lotus, not losing any of our DNA, not losing the fun that we've always given up over the last 70 years to everyone who's jumped into a Lotus, but this time being environmentally responsible and uh, being responsible towards the planet going forward. And that's uh, it uh, on what I wanted to tell you about Lotus, our future journey, about Tavaya, and uh, about our core values. I hope uh, that was okay, and uh, I'll be open to you asking any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Uday, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I'm glad you're open for questions. We've got plenty of questions coming in from the audience. So, great, thank you, Paul, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, as, I, as I said, and yes, uh, very much looking forward to the audience questions and try to answer as many as I can. Okay. So first of all, Uday, why do all Lotus cars begin with an E? <laughs> uh, great question indeed. Um, to be perfectly honest, we're still researching the reasons for uh, you know that to be the case, but we love it. Uh, and hence, uh, what I can say, I unfortunately can't answer, I'm really sorry, 
that I can't answer exactly that question. Uh, there is some good research. We have several, uh, you know, things that we found, but we can't pinpoint to the exact reason. But one thing I can confirm is that is going to continue. Thanks, Uthi. Next question. Is the sudden onslaught of CV19 going to make a big difference to your Vision 80? CVP um, COVID-19. Uh, yes, I, I guessed so. Thank, thank you, Paul. So, um, uh, of course, like every other business um, out there, COVID-19 has obviously had uh, a significant impact on our plans. Uh, however, I think uh, we've got to say that we are extremely grateful to be in a growth phase uh, instead of uh, normal business. And um, given that the plans were in place well before COVID hit us, uh, things are progressing extremely well, better than um, the rest of the industry, especially in the UK, which we are really pleased about and uh, grateful for. But uh, I cannot deny that um, COVID has had an impact, especially on Evaya delivery and uh, some of the other cars we're working on. As you can imagine, testing has been a big factor that uh, has got impacted because of um, COVID travel restrictions and so on. So, yes, there have been some challenges, but uh, we are currently working on delivering exactly to plan for Vision 80. Great, great to hear, Rudy. Um, another question. How did you arrive at the key performance targets for the year? Did you start with targets and then figure out how to achieve these, or did you start with the technology and figure out what could be achieved? Good question. Oh, fantastic question. <laughs> um, well, I have to say it's a it's a hybrid of, of those two. Uh, it is how we ended up, you know, going about it. Um, we had some targets in mind based on uh, you know our Lotus DNA, and which is why I you know, went on about Lotus DNA for a bit. But, um, you know, it was extremely important. The car had to be a Lotus. It had to be that mid-engine layout. It had to be extremely cap forward. It had to have that driver position that, uh, you know, is cocooned by the rest of the car. And as I achieved it, to wear the car, not sit in the car. So all of those factors were extremely important. The um, lightweight, you know, general attitude of our cars and uh, the dynamics, vehicle dynamics, those were extremely important for us. So we we focused on them to start with. But this was a statement for our future, from a design perspective, from um, from a um, technology perspective. So when you couple those things on top of our normal DNA, that's when you come up with all sorts of new uh, challenges and new targets. More we tested, more we found out. And I have to say, for 18 months, the first 18 months of this program, the targets kept uh, stretching because we could find more and more out of this uh, technology that's in the car. So, yeah, and we're still finding more. And I can tell you that the car, when it comes out, will be potentially even better than what we've announced the spec to be. Great to hear that. Another question. Any plans for a fully electric Elise? And, and just to clarify, <laughs> no, not under a third but the British Lotus one. Uh, great question, yes. Um, I mean, I, I, we, we do not comment on uh, future as you know, any other company, so I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right of me to comment on our future product plans. But, um, you know, we, we are looking and working on several products uh, in the electric arena so um, there will be some you know good uh, news on that side in the coming years okay slightly different angle with this one uday how do you foresee the challenge of the likes of aston martin backed by mercedes with the development of the technologies in the vision 80 future um, well, well, I think uh, it, if I may answer that in a more broader fashion, um, I think the the general way the industry is going is that it will need more and more partnerships than 
um, then um, how do I say? Uh, then trying to compete with each other uh, at every angle. So what I expect and what I am already seeing is more great brands and companies working together in uh, in bringing out good, really exciting products out. So expect uh, to see more things being done together. Than in competition. Okay, different angle again, Uday. Will we see Lotus back in Formula One, or perhaps a new championship like Formula E, part of its future plans, given its prestigious motorsport heritage? Uh, well, great question, and uh, all I can say is I cannot answer that yet, but. Uh, if we are not in motorsports, we've not done our job um, as you know, as part of uh, the Lotus, as we call ourselves, as lot. Um, so there will be participation in, in motorsports, certainly. I can't tell you which ones, though. We are evaluating uh, all, all forms of motorsport at the moment. Just looking for another question, New Day. Sure. Seem to have just lost the question tab at the moment. It is quite unfortunate for us uh, to be doing it this way because of what the world is in. I would have loved for all of us to be together and uh, having face to face discussions, but. Uh, Hopefully, this is allowed from for people from further away to be participating in it. Yeah. Okay, we just seem to have lost the question tab. If you just bear with us. Technical hitch. Right, okay, we're back. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, The Avia is an incredible project. The development must have been immense. To make this possible, has it been necessary for Lotus to form automotive partnerships, perhaps in the way they did to develop the Elise? Good question. Absolutely. Um, I think, as I said earlier, a partnership is the way the industry is heading, especially in the automotive industry. And we wouldn't be uh, successful in the future if we shied away from doing that and wanted to do everything ourselves. So absolutely, if I, uh, uh, and, and like many other car projects that are out there and will, you know, come out, uh, there are a number of, uh, you know, very important partnerships that we've formed in bringing the product out. Um, I mean, one of the very important ones is, uh, of course, the Williams Advanced Engineering, you know, two very iconic British brands coming together and working together. Um, and they bring in the propulsion system technology, which is uh, quite uh, significantly advanced to anything out there. And there are many other such things, especially on the you know electronic side of things and the battery uh, side of things. So yes. Okay. Can you share with us what the most challenging attribute trade-off was to ensure that the vehicle satisfied the driver? Oh, wow. Um, many, I have to say, there were many trade-offs. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as you can imagine, it's a, you know, four uh, motor 
layout um, and quite extremely energy dense uh, and power dense uh, setup um, mid engine layout so you could you could try and get you know quite a few extremely amazing attributes out of it but uh, as you can imagine you've always got to trade off especially when it become, comes to a electric propulsion system uh, and trying to achieve something like 2000 horsepower from it so the, the i think the most important trade-offs uh, for me were um the the sort of top speed versus acceleration kind of uh, features um and most electric cars boast of uh, zero to 60 and, and normally in less than two seconds and almost defying the laws of physics uh, for us, it, that wasn't the most important thing um, whilst everyone's fighting for it. We wanted to stick to being true Lotus and hence uh, going around corners and handling well was far more important for us and hence the car is set up for slightly different um, uh, attributes, if you like, if that answers the question. Great. Thanks, Udi. Another one. How will, this is a good one. How will you entice some of your more traditional customers, i.e. those who want to experience the feel of an internal combustion engine, to purchase a car like this? Uh, well, we've, we've had um, the you know, amazing privilege to produce uh, and, uh, and, and, how do I say, please, 100,000 enthusiasts out there in our last 70 years. Um, and it would be foolish of us to say we disown them and do something new for the new generation. So uh, that is certainly something that uh, we firmly believe in, in making sure that we are true to our history and uh, heritage. So expect some really good products coming out to keep our current consumer base extremely engaged. Uh, first of which you will see next year. Okay. On the subject of future product, do Lotus to see all of their future projects being a full EV? Obviously, the Avia is a drastically different price point to all that preceded it. Will there ever be an affordable Lotus again? Uh, well, there's several definitions of what's affordable, I have to say, and um, uh, <laughs> and. Um, yes, I mean, if you talk about the current affordability levels of uh, the current Lotus product range, I can certainly say that uh, we're not going to venture away from this. We will continue to produce cars uh, in this range and, and more. Uh, but yes, certainly, we, we I, I would not like us to be called affordable cars or cheap cars. That was never the case. They were right. Uh, for what they were uh, without uh, ripping people off for you know just be, to being a niche manufacturer and I think that has to continue so yes that will certainly continue going forward and appropriately Uday on that topic what is the price of this car <laughs> uh, very affordable uh, for some so there are 130 of these cars and uh, each car is priced uh, at a starting price of two million pounds, and every car that has been spegged by customers, um, obviously, each car has been bespokely done, and uh, hence it's quite north of that. Um, do you think going forwards, millennials or, or Gen Zs will embrace luxury car markets? Uh, certainly, certainly. And I think uh, this is a great question in terms of what luxury means going forward. And um, I think I see several definitions of luxury in a word, world of, um, you, know, you know, sustainability being the focus going forward. Uh, I think luxury will be seen very differently and um, luxury as unnecessary is going to have to change. Uh, going forward and that's something we will certainly want to create and we're working hard on it and we i, I certainly think there is 
a big place for the new generations to pick up on it uh, and uh, and embrace it yes okay uh, back to the technical uh, now um, the battery shape for the via is unconventional when compared to the battery packs developed by other oems which have a greater surface area with respect to volume what challenges did this shape present for battery fueling and how were these overcome yeah, absolutely, um, and spot on with the challenge. And I think, as I said before, we had to produce a car which is true to Lotus layout, Lotus design, and give us that mid-engine layout. And uh, you know, it was extremely important for us to achieve many of the attributes that we really wanted the car to be great at. And that uh, created this battery layout. It's it's very unconventional, and. Um, what I can say is, when we started working on it, it felt very impossible. But um, as we worked on it, obviously we've, we've managed to resolve most of the issues. Thermal management is certainly an extremely big challenge. Um, you would be surprised to know that um, the thermal management is a hybrid of um, very conventional cooling mechanisms uh, in terms of uh, plates and um, you know a very simple cooling. Uh, you know mechanisms, but um, also some quite unconventional things, especially active cooling. So, yes, big challenge uh, does drive the weight of the system up. Um, but uh, I think thankfully that weight in the right place has helped us achieve what we wanted to achieve for the car. Great. Let, let's stay on the battery theme, Uday. What is the minimum recharge time for the battery? Uh, Great question. I think uh, obviously at different speeds, uh, um, different capacities, it's it's quite different. As you can imagine, um, the electrical or electronics engineers out there were better at this topic than me will understand this better. But uh, we're currently working at uh, 350 kilowatt charging and it should be uh, charged under nine minutes. Okay. And, and staying on the drive line, Uday, is the Avia all-wheel drive? And if so, what's the power ratio front to rear? And who's designed and supplied the motors? Uh, well, I can't uh, go into the you know the supplier list of the car, but uh, I can certainly tell it's so one of the very premium motors and very specially designed only for this car. And uh, in near future, when we start talking about the car, more we will we will go into those topics um but yes um i think uh sorry the, the first bit of the question sorry paul was um could you repeat that for me please is it all wheel drive is it all wheel drive it, Uday? yes it so. is it is and the ratio yeah yes yeah. so yeah. we are still um working on some of the attributes which we believe can be significantly improved, and hence we're still working on the ratio. But uh, the ratio is very, very similar to what you would expect in a very high-end sports car. Okay. Slightly biased towards the rear, if you like, if that helps. Okay. Today, in the presentation, you mentioned the downforce generated at 1,700 kilograms. At uh, what speed is this developed? Uh, great question. Quite high speed <laughs> without confirming it because there is something we've got to do with that high speed in showcasing the capability of the car. So I'd leave it at that for now. Uh, but yes, very, very high speed. Just under 200 miles an hour. Are there plans for hydrogen-powered Lotus cars, either hydrogen ICE or hydrogen fuel cell? Uh, wow. Um, the, we, we are looking at uh, hydrogen uh, or fuel cells as a propulsion technology, as research uh, at this stage. But uh, no, we're not looking at... Um, you know, using it as a propulsion system in any of our currently planned future products. 
and the, the main reason is uh, the commercial availability of uh, of, of this uh, you know fuel if you like and without that electric is hard enough for consumers to digest so going into something even more challenging is not the right thing at this stage we believe okay uh, let's go focus down a little bit more detailed now what's the most innovative component on the car what's the most innovative component i think uh, i'm a lover of uh, general physics and uh, hence for me and many of uh, future technologists might not like this but uh, for me the best thing is the passive or natural aerodynamics of the car the porosity of the car is the most innovative way of designing a car to get the performance we've achieved um, there are active aerodynamics tools on this car certainly but um, the need for them is minimized by the design itself of the car okay um, a couple of a couple more questions we're coming up coming up to the uh, the hour mark um, what was the largest challenge during the early concept stage? Did anything have to go back to the drawing board for a major rethink? Uh, many things, I have to say. I think the biggest challenge for us was um, our own um, acceptance of the electric propulsion technology to be powering a Lotus um, for many reasons. And it was a fight with ourselves. Uh, within the company was the biggest challenge, I have to say. And we went around this several times. But uh, in terms of, you know, systems and parts, as you can imagine, there have been many things that have gone back to the drawing board. The the carbon monocoque tub, as um, you saw in the in one of the pictures, uh, as you know, it's hand laid, it's it's one piece, it's huge. It's, it's a challenge to to manufacture, challenge to you know, then assemble into a car, challenge to maintain as a car. And I'm sure you understand challenge to m maintain if something goes wrong with the car in the future. So, yeah, a lot of things have been designed for, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, the engineering prowess of the car, but also manufacturing design for manufacturing design for service and so on. So th that was quite a challenge. Okay, so maybe a final question here, Ude. Uh, similar, staying on the design and development theme. What type of simulations were used in the development of the Avia? Uh, oh, great question. Um, I think uh, what I can say is uh, the engineering development of this car was extremely heavily biased towards simulation. And uh, again, without listing every tool that we use, I mean, I'm sure people out there in uh, in industries similar to us or within, especially within the automotive industry, you will know exactly what tools and what uh, techniques and so on. We, what I can say is slightly different to what the question is, is um, that we worked um, far too much in the simulation world, given what this car was, was trying to achieve. Uh, certain things we can't even test and we're still trying to figure out how to test them in the physical world. And then with the the um, unfortunate situation with COVID, that's forced us to use simulation even more. And it has certainly helped us develop a lot of simulation tools, a lot of correlation uh, to, to real world and, and, and so on. And it will be utilized in the future products going forward. So certainly uh, a heavy, heavily simulation uh, computer aided design philosophy uh, driven car. Today, I guess one very quick final question. Are all of the 130 already sold? Uh, not all 130, but uh, most of them are. Uh, most of them have been spec'd. Uh, the, the challenge is to get them built now. We're not, uh, you know, we're sort of going slow because of COVID on uh, taking any further orders uh, and specking further cars because we need to get the car into production first. Okay. New day. Um, just remains to say thanks very much for a fascinating lecture this evening uh, and thanks for um, 
taking the patience and the time to answer some some really excellent questions actually and um thank you um the audience um on behalf of the automobile division for participating in tonight's webinar thank you very much have a safe evening goodbye Thank you, Paul. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, like you say, thank you to all the audience and uh, some really amazing questions. And uh, I'm really sorry if I've not been able to answer all your questions, but it's great having you uh, to listen to our story. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.